NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? Good. Well, thanks for coming out to join us for this uh, rather unique <laughs> event. So atomic clocks are an integral yet almost invisible component of modern life. For example, they provide the foundation of the now ubiquitous global positioning system, enabling an entire industry of location-aware applications. And they also underpin the global financial and trading system, where transactions have to be tagged to millisecond precision. For space exploration, they have been the foundational frequency standard for NASA's Deep Space Network, which is the infrastructure that tracks a multitude of NASA's robotic spacecraft. NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock Technology Demonstration Mission, led by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, has been maturing the latest atomic clock technologies into a smaller, less massive package suitable for installation on a variety of deep space probes to enhance navigation precision and gravity science across the solar system. Tonight, we're lucky to have two guests from the project to tell us all about it. Dr. Todd Ely is currently the principal investigator for the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project. A graduate of Purdue University and a former Air Force officer, he has over 29 years of experience in astrodynamics and space navigation. He has been at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since 1999, developing and implementing navigation systems and architectures for many projects, big and small, including NASA's Mars Network, the former Constellation program, and the Altair, Altair Lunar Lander. His research focuses on new navigation methods, adoptive na navigation, nonlinear dynamics, and mean element theory. Alan Farrington is currently the project manager for the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project. A graduate of Duke University and Caltech, he has degrees in electrical engineering and more than 25 years of experience in hardware and software development, with almost 20 years of that in space applications. Alan has managed a variety of instrument and flight developments for Earth science, planetary science, and spacecraft technology development. Other than space flight, Alan's interests tend, tend towards college hoops and ballroom dancing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guests, Dr. Todd Ely and Alan Farrington. Thanks, Mark. Thanks all for coming. Alan and I are pretty excited to talk about the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project today. Um, the Deep Space uh, Atomic Clock Project is developing an advanced prototype of a, a new type of atomic clock that we hope to demonstrate in low Earth orbit beginning in the near future. Um, now, the atomic clock, obviously, it can tell time very accurately. But that's not how we intend to really use it for um, navigation and science. It's a key component to those aspects. And so over the course of the next hour or so, we'd like to talk to you about how clocks and time play an integral role to the nav and science that we do in deep space. And to begin that, um, we have a little video to set the stage. Time. It seems to rule everything we do. You have to have a really thought about how important time is to us. You see, sitting amidst the hours and minutes of our day is our forgotten little friend, Sammy the Second. Often overlooked, Sammy's not only the heartbeat of time, but he plays a crucial part in another area of human progress, navigation. But what does time have to do with navigation, you ask? Well, got a second to find out? It all began long ago, when sea explorers carried clocks on board their ships, called chronometers. These clocks were set to the exact time as a clock back on land, and together with observing the sun, moon, and stars, they could determine their longitude and latitude. This process allowed maps to be drawn so other ships could know where they were going. Amazing! However, clocks back then weren't very accurate. And if a ship's chronometer drifted off by even a few Sammies from the main clock, it could mean the difference between finding their destination and being hopelessly lost. Today, 
time is a precise part of a type of navigation called the Global Positioning System, or GPS. Yes, boats, planes, cars, and even our very own smartphones receive data back from orbiting satellites that calculate our longitude and latitude coordinates. This allows you to arrive at a destination within feet. Pizza. So you see, down here on Earth, it's only because of time, I mean, Sammy, that we can know where we are and where we're going. But what about in space? Not just space, but deep space. How do you navigate and explore a place where there are no longitude and latitude lines, no orbiting satellites to help? Right now, scientists navigate spacecraft by using giant antennas here on Earth. <laughs> no, not those kind. These kind. Just like the old sea explorers and our GPS, these antennas send out a signal that is bounced off the spacecraft straight back to the Earth. Scientists then measure the time it took for this round trip, and that's what determines the spacecraft's distance and speed. While bouncing signals off our spacecraft works, that isn't the most efficient way to navigate deep space. You see, the antenna can only talk to one spacecraft at a time, leaving others waiting for up to a day. And then by the time the signal's calculated and sent back, the spacecraft isn't in the same spot anymore and the results have to be adjusted. So, how can deep space exploration become even more efficient, exact and precise? How can a spacecraft's navigation as it travels further and further into space be more immediate and independent of having to check in with... What's that, Sammy? Of course! The Deep Space Atomic Clock. Scientists and engineers have now developed a way for the spacecraft to have its own onboard clock, so it no longer has to check in with Earth for its coordinates. This breakthrough device is smaller, self-sufficient, and can handle the harsh conditions of deep space. Now the spacecraft can make immediate course corrections on its own, and land with incredible precision. So you see, our little friend Sammy the Second is finally getting his due, paving the way for more precise and efficient space exploration, one tick, tock, tick at a time. So Alan and I are going to attempt to elaborate a little further on what Sammy had to talk about. And we can begin our journey talking about DSAC actually going back in time and talking about navigation. And one of the key components of navigation, obviously, is a map. And so to navigate on Earth, uh, maps have been drawn for a millennia. And here's an example of a map that was drawn in 1630 by Philip Eckbrecht. And what's notable about the map is that this is the first map to identify uh, 15 degrees of longitude with one hour of rotation of the Earth about its axis. And so um, how we use maps is not only to define, obviously, the points of interest that we would like to travel to, but we have a reference system. And in this case, our reference system are lines of latitude and lines of longitude. Seafarers have known for millennia how to find latitude. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, we sight the North Star, Polaris, determine the elevation of that star above the horizon, and using that information, you can determine your latitude. Longitude has been a trickier problem. Um, there are a number of methods that were devised over, over the many thousands of years, um, the earliest of which was dead reckoning. Sailors would drop a rope with knots at the, at the bow of a ship, and they would see how long it took for, the, for those knots to arrive at the stern of the ship. And from that, you can compute velocity. And then with your time, you can compute your distance. It's not a very accurate method. At the time, there are other methods. Uh, the method, the astronomical method of lunar distances. And this was competing with using clocks uh, to determine longitude. Now, how we could use a clock to determine our longitude is at your point of departure, let's say it's Britain, you set your time to the ground clock there. You know your longitude because you've got your nifty map. And then you set off on, your, on your, your travels. Each day at high noon, you check the time on that clock. You compute the difference between that clock's time and high noon. And now you have a measure of your, the longitude distance that you've traveled during your travels. And so that actually is the method that um, 
has established itself as the norm, at least back in the 17th or 18th century. And in fact, um, in 1714, the British Parliament was so desperate to figure out a solution to this problem, the longitude problem, uh, they set up a prize to 20,000 pounds to the person who could figure out how to solve this. Um, John Harrison toiled for decades building many clocks. Um, the challenge that he had was to take the accuracy of the ground clocks of the day, which were big, and try and develop something that was portable on a ship that could withstand the harsh environment that a, a ship presents to a clock stability. So what I mean by clock stability is, as a clock ticks every second, a clock is very stable if each second is the same length and time. If that length and time varies, you have an instability. And so on a ship, things like humidity changes or temperature swings or the motion of the ship can affect the stability of the, of the chronometer. Well, on Her John's fourth try, H4, he built this watch right here. It's about five in inches in diameter. And it was successful at achieving the objectives of the longitude prize. In 1762, a ship set, set on a, a, a course from Britain to the West Indies. And in that 62-day journey, it lost five seconds of time. The stability of that clock was one-tenth of a second per day. And that yielded about a two-kilometer error in longitude. That was good enough to navigate and actually set about the way in which mariners for the next couple of centuries would figure out their longitude. But civilization evolves and technology improves and our navigational needs and demands increase. So fast forward to the 1960s and um, the Navy needed a way to figure out where their ships and submarines are to a much greater accuracy than would be provided by chronometers. A system was built called Transit. It's about 10 orbiting satellites, low altitude, about 11, 1,100 kilometers. And it was designed so that as satellites would overfly the US, they would be tracked. Those tracking stations would compute the orbits of the spacecraft. And then that would be uploaded to the spacecraft. And then when that satellite would fly over a ship or a submarine, it would send a signal to that ship or submarine. And using uh, knowledge and the ship, using knowledge of where the spacecraft is at, because it would broadcast its location, it would measure the frequency shift of this signal transiting from the satellite to the ship. Now, you can use this information to figure out your location. But what it requires in this one-way signal is that the clock on board the satellite and the clock on board the ship are very accurate. And so chronometers weren't good enough. To respond to that, uh, the technology for clocks shifted to using something like a quartz crystal. And so here's a picture of the first uh, USO ultra-stable oscillator that flew on one of the transit satellites in 1960. And the way a quartz crystal oscillator uh, works is it uses the mechanical vibration of the quartz in an electromagnetic field to do its ticking. Um, this dramatically improved the accuracy of the navigation systems of the time. Transit could determine the location of a, a ship to about 200 meters. Uh, and we even use USOs in deep space. In fact, here's a picture of the USO that we intend to fly on our mission, the DSAC mission. Um, they're often used in deep space for a lot of uses, navigation sometimes, but they're still not good enough. On our, on our mission, we built a USO that is stable to better than a microsecond per day. It's good, but it's not good enough for deep space nap. And in fact, the transit system responded to the need of the time, but it wasn't good enough for global positioning. We're all familiar with this constellation, the global positioning system. It's a system of 32 satellites. And this responded to the challenges presented by transit by offering more coverage. 32 satellites um, yield over four satellites in view at most locations on the Earth all the time, and often more than four satellites. So this coverage allows us to get positioning to a much greater accuracy than 100 meters. And another fundamental aspect of this is there are now atomic clocks on board uh, the spacecraft, the satellites. And those atomic clocks are needed to ensure that the signals that are sent from each satellite are extremely precise and accurate. The fact that there are 32 satellites means that the user's clock, 
doesn't need to be nearly as accurate. You don't need a USO. You don't need an atomic clock. Everybody who has a smartphone has a GPS receiver inside their phone, and they don't have an atomic clock. So how does this, how do we determine our position more accurately, given that we have a, a worse performing clock in our phone or other ground GPS receivers? So I'm going to do a little thought experiment with you all to try and illustrate how this, this process works. It's a very simplified example, but the fundamentals are true for the more complicated situations in which we use navigation with GPS. So I'm going to go to flat land, a two-dimensional uh, space. And I have three GPS satellites indicated here in the corners. And I'm somewhere in here. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm at. And I'm going to take measurements with my GPS receiver that's in my phone. And the way in which this works is I'll get signals from each one of these satellites instantaneously and simultaneously. With that first measurement, I'll get a measure of range. And the way this works is the satellite will essentially send a signal on the tone the time is. Um, and when I receive it, wherever I'm at, I'll have a measure of range as well as how off a measure of how far off my, my local clock is. So the GPS satellites are about 20,000 kilometers in altitude. It takes about 70 milliseconds for that signal to uh, arrive here on Earth. I'm going to compare that time to what my phone says, and I'm going to have some measure of this distance plus the error in my clock. So with that singular measurement, I could be anywhere in this band where the band represents my clock error. So with the second GPS measurement, I have this measure of range, and I can be anywhere in this band. But if I combine the two of them, I'm somewhere in this football-shaped region. So I've now actually fixed myself somewhere here with just two measurements, but I still don't know my time. I need a third measurement. With that third measurement, my location gets more precise, and now I have another piece of information that says, your clock's time is x. So that's, in a nutshell, how our receivers in our phones and other GPS receivers work today. But it's still not good enough for deep space navigation. We don't have a plethora of satellites distributed across the solar system to do that kind of navigation job. What we do have is the deep space network. The deep space network was formed uh, about the time that NASA was formed at the end of the 1950s. And the way in which we get tracking data to our satellites and our probes and spacecraft are through these rather humongous antennas. If this picture over here, this is the feed horn of this 70-meter antenna out in Goldstone in California. And that's a person standing on the end. They're big. And the reason why they're big is that they need to transmit a very powerful signal to spacecraft and satellites that are hundreds of millions of kilometers away. Those satellites don't have the transmission power to return it. So these antennas, um, excuse me, they do have the power to return it. They have high gain antennas on them as well. Um, but it starts with a large transmission um, from one of these stations. And you can imagine that there's, there are only three DSN complexes uh, on the Earth. They're separated longitudinally by 120 degrees, so that typically there's always one DSN station in view of a spacecraft or mini spacecraft that are in our solar system. And the way in which this system works, it uses ranging like the GPS, but we use two-way ranging typically today. And the reason why we use two-way ranging and Doppler is that the spacecraft clocks aren't good enough. At best, they have USOs today. And those USOs aren't stable enough so that the one-way signals we get with them will allow us to navigate accurately and precisely. Um, so the way the two-way signal works is it will send that tone. Um, at a certain time, it will send it up to the spacecraft. The spacecraft will turn it around and be received here back at Earth. And that's where the measurement takes place. And then on the ground, we'll process that data to figure out the, the trajectory of the spacecraft. Now, you can imagine that um, you need precision clocks and frequency sources in the stations, and we do. We have very precise, stable atomic standards, and Alan will talk to you and show you pictures of how big they are. Um, but they're very stable and precise. In fact, they only drift 
about a tenth of a nanosecond per day. It's an extremely tiny number. This is good enough for deep space navigation. So I'm going to do another thought experiment and illustrate um, how we do deep space navigation with these kinds of signals. And before I do that, uh, we have to keep in mind some of the lessons we learned about Earth-based navigation. We're in the solar system. We're traveling about. We need to figure out where we're at. What we need is a reference system. So on Earth, we had latitude and longitude. In deep space, we have a three-dimensional coordinate system that we define usually at the center, near the center of the sun. And we need a map. We need a map of where our destinations are, the trajectories of our planets and moons and asteroids. And with this map and this coordinate system and the DSN tracking data, we can resolve locations and trajectories of spacecraft. Um, but unlike GPS, where we didn't need precision models of how spacecraft move, because, the fact, because of only having maybe a single DSN station in view at any given time, we need precise models of how spacecraft move in space. For those of you who had a college physics class, these are the equations of motion that you were taught back in that day. And there are a number of forces that perturb the motion of spacecraft that are transiting through the solar system. Of course, all of the gravitational tugs of each of, of the planets needs to be accounted for. The fact that the gravity field at any given planet is non-uniform tugs on a spacecraft. The fact that the sun shines light, beams energy on a spacecraft, pushes it around too. We need to account for that. We need to account for the fact that space isn't flat. Einstein told us that it's curved. And so time will change its rate based on where we're at in the, gra in the gravity wells of each of these uh, solar system bodies. We have to account for that. We have to account for little gases that are emanating for our spacecraft. All those things perturb the motion of the spacecraft. So if we couple our models of that spacecraft motion with the tracking data we get from the DSN, this is how it works, at least in this little 2D example. And now, like before, I have, I have a space with a reference system. Um, and in this example, I'm going to look at one-way data with a bad clock. So I don't have DSEC right now. And I have a single DSN station that's in view of a satellite. And the other thing that I know about this in this little experiment is I'm on a trajectory that's a straight line traveling at a constant velocity. That's a key piece of information for this to work. So the DSN station will get its first measurement to my, to them, my spacecraft. It's a measure of range. And like before, I can be anywhere on, that, on this curve because that's the same range here as it is here. And this band represents the error in my local spacecraft clock. I get another one at some later time. So it's not, it's not four measurements at the same time. It's at a different time. So I've moved. And so now the range to, to the spacecraft has changed. And I can be anywhere here. And I take another one, and I take another one. I have four pieces of information right now. And for my little simple model of a straight line motion with a constant velocity, that's actually enough to figure out where I'm at. But I have this problem. I have this large clock error. I could pick a solution like this. And this is perfectly satisfactory given the conditions I have in this problem. I could also pick that solution. That works. Both of these solutions are wrong. In fact, the right solution is that. But my data is not good enough to tell me that solution. So let's switch the scenario a little bit. Now we're getting two-way data. That's the way we do it today. Or we're getting one-way data with DSAC on board that spacecraft. <clears throat> Same thing. We get our first range measurement, our second, third, and fourth. But now you'll notice that my line is very narrow. That's because my clock is very accurate, or my two-way measurement is very accurate. In fact, the one-way data with DSAC is as accurate as the two-way data that we get today. Now I'm going to fit my line. I know it's a straight line. I know it's a constant velocity. That's the only line that works in this little example. And the reason why it works is because I have this precision measurement of range. So you can imagine this is a very simple example. It's a lot more complicated in real life, and it is. But fundamentally, this is how it works. So what does DSEC mean for the future of navigation in deep space? 
This is the way it works today. So I've, I've chosen another example to illustrate the flexibility and the scalability that DSEC implies for the way we do deep space, deep space navigation. We have a lot of orbiters and rovers on the surface of Mars today. Here's an example. We've got four orbiters at Mars. We've got maybe a spacecraft that's going to land on Mars. And we're going to try and track to each of these vehicles using two-way tracking. Well, today, you have a DS antenna, DSN antenna, and it will communicate with that spacecraft and get its two-way tracking. But because it's a two-way link, it's the only vehicle that's getting that tracking. So to get tracking on that orbiter, you need another antenna. And unfortunately, none of these satellites are getting any tracking. They have the timeshare. If all of these vehicles had DSAC and they're using one-way tracking, we can take advantage of the fact that the DSN can listen to more than one spacecraft at a time. It can listen to actually two, and there are plans to upgrade that to four. And so in this example, um, this spacecraft and that spacecraft can get the needed tracking for um, orbit determination or navigation. And in fact, this antenna is always, there is always an antenna broadcasting to Mars. You could track a signal on the uplink. And what's neat about uplink tracking is it's like a broadcast signal, like GPS or transit. It's a, it doesn't require this satellite to talk back to the DSN station. So anybody listening in can get one-way tracking that's good enough for navigation as long as they have DSAC. And furthermore, and this is leading to the latter part of the talk, is not only could you collect that data on board, now you have the possibility of processing it on board for autonomous navigation. So I'm going to let Alan talk now about how atomic clocks actually work. And then when he's done, we'll talk about how DSAC can be used for future navigation and exploration. All right, thank you. Thank you. This is not an atomic clock. <laughs> this is a sundial. Sundials have been used for the last 2,700 years, as far as we can tell, probably even earlier than that. But until the 1800s, sundials were considered the correct time. Even though we had pendulum clocks after that, um, until the 1800s, pendulum clocks weren't considered accurate enough. Now, a sundial works by measuring how the shadow of the sun is cast onto a flat plate. And there are lots of different variations of sundials. If you check out the Wikipedia article on sundial, you will learn that there are more sundials than there are types of clocks, probably. And they were invented over the centuries to solve problems that sundials have, like their accuracy varies with the time of year, because the Earth is not in a circular orbit around the sun. It's actually uh, an ellipse. And the shadow moves around a little bit. But in the 1800s, uh, or actually in the, in the um, Christian Huygens, the same Huygens of Saturn and Titan uh, fame, actually invented the first practical pendulum clock in, back in the 1600s. And um, these clocks work by measuring how much time it takes for a pendulum to swing. And that's a thing, that's a property of pendulums. It doesn't matter how heavy are, they are, it just matters how long they are, and that determines how much time they take to swim, swing back and forth. A sundial is an example of what's called an absolute clock. You don't have to do any adding, you just read right off the face what time it is. A pendulum clock, you have to add up all the swings, and like you've heard Todd talk about those bars being wide, these clocks where you have to add up these swings have errors. And every time you add the swings together, you add more and more errors. So pendulum clocks were not, were not good enough until they were engineered to be better than sundials only about 200 years ago. So after pendulum clocks in the 1920s, in the late 1920s, the quartz crystal clock was invented. Now that's the clock that's probably in your wristwatch, probably in your alarm clock if you still have one. A lot of people just use their phones for everything now. But Quartz crystal clocks, as Todd mentioned, rely on a different principle than a pendulum clock, but it's still something moving. It's a little piece of rock, quartz, that when it's placed in an electric field, it vibrates. And, it, and because of the shape, it's very precisely shaped. And because of the shape, it only vibrates at a certain frequency or a certain number of ticks. And just like a pendulum clock, a quartz clock, which is an order of magnitude over 10 times more accurate than a pendulum clock, it's still adding up these little ticks. 
And as Todd keeps saying, it's just not good enough for navigation. So we move into atomic clocks. And an atomic clock, this is a classic atomic clock. Um, this is a cesium beam clock. It's a type of clock that's used in reference clocks in television stations, in banks, in um, banks, yes. <laughs> they do time everything. Um, and all over the, the world. And banks of them are used together to create what we usually refer to as universal coordinated time. They're known as primary standards. And they don't vary very much at all. So what is an atomic clock? Well, it's atomic, but it's not atomic like this. This is actually, physicists call this nuclear. And an atomic clock is an atomic device. But they do share a same heritage in that they came about at roughly the same time back in the late 40s. Now, in DSAC, we use a mercury trap clock. And I'm going to tell you about that just a little bit. There are other types of atomic clocks, but the principle is, is reasonably the same, even though the details are immensely more complex, depending on the different ones. But we use a mercury atom here. Okay, It's got 80 electrons spinning around it in all these little shells. But the one we care about is the, the, actually the two on the outside shell, because those are the ones that we interact with. And we ionize these, which means we use an electric current to knock off one of the electrons. So then we only worry about the one. And we call this mercury atom and this electron up here, we, we refer to it as a quantum tuning fork. It will respond to certain radio signals, but only certain ones, the same way a tuning fork only vibrates at one frequency. So this is our little tuning fork. And what we do is we send a radio frequency at this atom and this radio frequency interacts with the electron. And if the frequency is not right, the tuning fork doesn't do anything. So the, molecule, the atom is not perturbed. If the frequency is a little faster, in my example, then it will vibrate with it. Now, it's not actually vibrating. It's actually doing a magnetic pole nuclear balance spin thing. And it's all sorts of physics. But this frequency, if it's exactly 40.5 and about 50 decimal points frequency, this atom will react in a way that we can then measure with the ultraviolet light. Now, one of the difficulties with all atomic clocks is these atoms are also not just affected by the frequency you're hitting them with, they're affected by the world around them. And so we try to, I like to say, we try to disconnect them from the universe. And we do that by trapping them. And so we put them inside of this little device, which is about the size of a Three Musketeers bar, Okay, it's the big bar, not the little bite-sized one. <laughs> and we basically, inside of these gold rods here, we form an electric field and we put a bunch of mercury atoms in there. We ionize them and they all stay in a little bottle. So they're in this little bottle. So they don't interact with any of the metal. They don't bounce off of anything. They just kind of fly around in lazy circles. And those lazy circles make them very calm. Okay, And when they're very calm, they can react very nicely to our radio waves that we pump in into these ports here. Okay? Now, um, uh, you might think, OK, it's mercury. Is this thing dangerous? It's not like a Snickers bar. Well, I mean, a Three Musketeers, which is dangerous in its own way, right? But the amount of mercury we actually have inside of our tube, there's more mercury in two cans of tuna fish. So there's only about 100,000 atoms of mercury inside of our, our tube, which is a very, very small amount of mercury. And it's a very precise uh, uh, way. It takes months to get the balance just right in the mercury as we build up these clocks. So now Todd was talking about how in the DSN we use these atomic clocks. And you may have heard recently um, uh, uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they're sort of the, our, the United States keeper of time. Um, they have a clock called NIST F1. And uh, it's the most accurate clock in the world right now. You know, it's sort of like who's the best quarterback. It's always flipping around between different organizations. But this thing is the size of a kitchen. In fact, it's the size of an industrial kitchen. Okay. And, uh, but it is, quite, it is quite accurate. It's a different technology than we use. That's where they throw the atoms up in the air and they let them come down. And while they're coming down, they're not connected to anything and they measure them that way. And that's what this big column's for. But our technology has been used in the DSN, and these things, they're called LITs. It stands for Linear Ion Trap something. And 
and it's about the size of a refrigerator. Now this is a, this is a fancy refrigerator. Each one of these is the size of a regular refrigerator. But you get the idea from a kitchen to a refrigerator to DSAC, which is about the size of a toaster oven. I could literally hold it right here and it's not all that heavy either. And that's the thing that this project has been doing is we've been taking a technology that's been in the works and been deployed in the DSN for you know, the last uh, five to 10 years and it's been in the works for even longer. And we've been shrinking it down so that we can put it on a spacecraft and use it in space the way that Todd has been talking about. Now, one of the key aspects of a technology demonstration mission, it's a little different than, norm than the normal type of mission that JPL does. Our goal is not to go and go to a certain place and collect science about a certain target, as we call it. It's to test this clock in the environment of space and on a spacecraft and see how well it works and to see where the warps are so that we can then design the real one to go to Jupiter or to Mars or to another planet. And these technology demonstration missions are a new class of missions that NASA has been doing for about the last four years where we're building this payload, so there's our little clock, there's the USO that Todd showed you earlier, and then this is a measurement device, it's a GPS receiver that we use to measure the clock in space. And we put it on a small spacecraft. This spacecraft is about the size of this podium. So it's, it's very small compared to, to, to normal JPL spacecraft that would you know, reach to the ceiling here. And we fly that spacecraft with a bunch of other spacecraft on a mission that the Air Force is running. Now, when I was a kid, I used to play Monopoly with my sisters. And you know, you're sitting there and you've got Baltic Avenue and you want North Carolina Avenue and your sister's got it. So you offer her, you know, a railroad and Baltic and maybe a little bit of cash to sweeten the deal. And then, but my other sister wants that too. So we work out the, like this three-way deal where there's all this money and property changing hands. Well, that's the way we get onto these missions in a way. What happens is, <laughs> Uh, Surrey, uh, Surrey, which is a, a United States uh, satellite provider, has a mission where they want to fly a lot of demonstration payloads. So we're paying them for a seat on their spacecraft. It's sort of like buying an airline ticket. We didn't buy the spacecraft, we're just buying a spot on it. And they've got some other payloads. And then we're also paying for two Air Force payloads to be on this spacecraft so that the Air Force will turn around and give us a ride on their rocket. So we start trading things around and it makes for a very interesting and complex arrangement, but it also saves the taxpayers a whole lot of money because we're not paying at all, anything at all for this rocket. The Air Force is flying this rocket for another reason, and all of these satellites that are on this rocket are sort of getting a free ride uh, because the Air Force wants to check this out. This is a Falcon Heavy, by the way, which is the next version of the Falcon 9 uh, that SpaceX is planning to fly later this year for the first time, and it's basically three Falcon 9s tied together. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful rocket and the Air Force is wanting to check it out. So we get to ride pretty much for free just for carrying a couple of their other little payloads. So that's sort of how we work these deals out. So I think I'm going to hand it back over to Todd here. He's going to switch back now to what we do with the clock in some fancy ways. Thanks, Alan. Oh, you're going to describe the mission. Yeah. That's right. So the rocket puts us in space. It's a low Earth orbit on board that Surrey spacecraft that Alan talked about. Um, we're scheduled currently to launch September 2016, but things move, and so we'll see if that's the date that we actually fly. Um, but once we are in space, Surrey obviously needs to check out its spacecraft for a few weeks, and then they turn us on for about a month. And then after that month, we've checked out DSAC. We think it's working okay. We're ready to start our nominal mission, and that's about five months long. And the way in which we're going to operate our mission is that receiver that Alan talked about is going to receive GPS signals from the InView constellation. So this spacecraft is in about a 700-kilometer orbit. The GPS satellites are at about a 20,000-kilometer orbit. We see a lot of GPS satellites. We see, on average, about 12 in view continuously. That's a lot of data. And it's fair to ask, OK, DSAC, you're a new type of atomic clock. You just said GPS has atomic clocks. DSAC's supposed to be better than those atomic clocks. How's that going to work? Well, it turns out that there are over 400 tracking stations on Earth tracking the GPS constellation all the time. And those tracking stations have determined the location of each satellite continuously to about two centimeters. 
and the clock on board that satellite to about 50 picoseconds. So even though the GPS clock isn't as stable as our clock, it's moving around, we know how it's moving around. And we can take that information with these measurements and we can determine how well our clock operates. And so our requirement is to show that DSAC stability is better than two nanoseconds per day. And our goal is about three tenths of a nanosecond per day. And if you remember back when I was talking about the DSN, it's about a tenth of a nanosecond per day. So we're really in the ballpark of what the DSN is able to provide. And in fact, at these levels, other errors in those range and Doppler measurements start to dominate those measurements and the clock error essentially goes away. And so with that, we're hoping to demonstrate DSAC's utility for future missions, you know, show that it can navigate OTB quite well. Um, and then after that first five months, um, we're not a big mission and we're trying to do this as efficiently and I don't want to say cheaply, but you know, as economically as we can. And so we've got our data and that's enough to validate the clock. Now what we're interested in is just making sure the thing still ticks because for long life duration missions, you need to work for more than a year. We're only going to operate for a year, but theoretically we could operate longer um, as long as we keep paying the rent on the Surrey spacecraft. So, cool stuff. This is our demonstration um, clock. Uh, it's a prototype clock. It's not the final clock that would go on a future mission. What you would do next is, and what we're learning as part of our project is how we would actually shrink this thing further. So this is about nine inches by 10 inches by 11 inches. We've already got lots of ideas how to probably cut that by a quarter and make it about this big. And that's very reasonable to fly on future space missions. And so some of the ways in which we can use DSAC for future missions in the arena of science and navigation, let's talk about that a little bit. So um, uh, here's, a, here's an illustration of Cassini transmitting a signal through the rings and received here at the DSN. This is that one-way signal again. And what the Cassini has to use today are USOs. And USOs are great. You get a lot of data to probe the rings, but DSAC would be about 10 to 100 times more accurate than that measurement. And so we could learn a lot more about those rings if DSAC were on board Cassini. Places like Mars, spacecraft transmit signals through the atmosphere as the satellite rises and set, and that signal gets affected by the atmosphere. And we can learn a lot about that atmosphere by uh, measuring these signals. Again, this is a one-way signal, and so Mars orbiters have USOs, and that signal is received back here at the DSN, and the USO is the limiting air source. If DSAC were on board, that measurement would be 10 to 100 times more accurate. Other ways in which we can use DSAC is put DSAC on board an orbiter. Um, recall that little illustration I had earlier where those satellites were getting a lot of data almost continuously. Well, with DSAC, we could take advantage of that for an orbit around Mars. And using DSAC with all that data and using the fact that we can downlink to the DSN at Ka band. So today, we traditionally use X band, which is about 8 gigahertz. Ka band is about 40 odd gigahertz. Um, the data that we would get at Ka band is about 10 times more accurate than at X band. So if you double the data and you improve the data, we could start determining things like the gravity field, the long-term gravity field at Mars very accurately. One of the things that we learned recently is that there's a lot of um, ice uh, mass redistributions over the course of a year, a, a Martian year. DSAC might be able to contribute to understanding that better. Other ways in which we can use DSAC is NASA is developing a a spacecraft to explore Europa. It's a moon of Jupiter. Um, Europa is encased in an uh, ice shell, and all of our data says that there is an ocean underneath that ice. And one of the key things that this Europa flyby mission is going to do is, is probe the characteristics of the ice and the ocean underneath using a variety of instruments. Um, and one of those uh, investigations is going to involve determining the gravity field around Europa. And much like before this example, we're probing the gravity field here. 
we're probing the gravity field of Europa, and through that gravity field determination, we can detect and confirm that ocean underneath the ice. Unfortunately, to get that data, we either have to point this high gain antenna at Earth or deploy uh, medium gain antennas on this and other facets of the spacecraft and point that vehicle to Earth to get it. And what that means is all of these instruments that are oriented towards Europa get pointed away. That's not good. So what DSAC could do is we could take advantage of the fact that on board every spacecraft are these little low gain antennas. And what's nifty about low gain antennas is they have, they have a, a large view of, of, of space around them. These antennas, these high gain antennas, have a very narrow view. So we take those low gain antennas, and you remember that DSN antenna that was big with all that power transmitting? We can actually track those signals with low gain antennas on board a vehicle that's at Europa. If you add DSAC to that mix, now that data that we're collecting is accurate, accurate enough to determine the gravity field. And in fact, if DSAC were to be on board this vehicle, we'd deliver about three times more data than we would get using, say, for instance, this high gain antenna. Other missions that NASA is contemplating is sending balloons to Titan. Titan has an atmosphere of nitrogen. We speculate that there, is, there are seas of methane. Um, it's a very um, oceany world. Um, and one of the ways in which we can explore it is set a balloon afloat in the atmosphere and let it drift. But one of the things we, would be, that would be difficult is to track where that balloon is at as it's coursing over, over Titan. If you had a very small version of DSAC, took advantage of that DSN transmitting that high power to this vehicle. In fact, you'd probably have to array four 34 meter antennas to get enough power up there. You could actually track this balloon as it's flying over Titan and chart its course. And so now you could correlate that course with all the science data that the balloon is collecting and transmitting back to Earth. So those are nifty science applications. Let's get back to navigation. And I'm going to look at Mars. Um, one of the next missions that we're envisioning going to Mars is, a, is an orbiter in 2022. Um, and one of the ways in which we're hoping or planning right now is to insert into a low Martian orbit using solar electric propulsion. Solar electric propulsion provide, or imparts a small acceleration and the spacecraft will slowly spiral into a low Martian orbit. Navigation-wise, it's a pretty intense period of time. It takes a long time. If you had DSAC on board, you could take advantage of the ability to get all that data without impacting other missions that need that data at the same time. And you could collect it and process it and improve our ability to do navigation. Another way in which DSAC um, could be helpful is thinking forward to humans going to Mars. There's going to be probably an armada of vehicles going to Mars. If you had DSAC on board and you had uplink transmissions to those spacecraft and you coupled DSAC with onboard computers, you could compute your trajectory in real time that the astronauts could use to um, safely and robustly um, make their way to Mars, either in orbit or land. So those are some of the applications we're envisioning. Um, I hope you liked our talk today. And I thought I'd end with just a few pictures here illustrating clocks over the past quarter millennium and numerically the improving stability that we see with each of those. So there is Harrison's H4 watch at a tenth of a second per day. And then came along USOs about in the 1960s. And they're 10,000 times more stable at this microsecond per day. And now we have DSAC at about three tenths of a nanosecond per day and 3,000 times more stable than that. Thank you for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions you all might have. If anybody has any questions, come down to the mics. Oh, we did too good of a job explaining everything. It's crystal clear. Uh, Don't be shy. Oh, here's one. Um, I have a question. So the most accurate clock in the whole world, 
Um, you said a little bit about how you can try and measure the accuracy of very accurate clocks using this constellation of GPS satellites. How is the error in the most accurate clock in the world measured? It's a voting scheme. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you, you, it's more accurate than any other clock. It's not more accurate than a bunch of clocks together. Okay. And so mathematically, you can combine the accuracy of what's called an ensemble of clocks and compare it against that. It's very similar to what we're doing with, with DSAC on orbit. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, there's another one. Oh, we have a... I've got a question. Well, what limits the lifetime of this clock? And how long lifetime do you think it has? Does it have to go to deep space and last for years? So, uh, I'll let Alan answer that one. I'm sorry. What so, was... so, so, so what limits the lifetime of this clock? And how do you know it's going to work for many years to get to the other solar system? Right. The solar system? So the limitation for most space-faring uh, equipment are the electronics and the fact that it's it's alternately either very cold and very hot or it's just very cold all the time or as the spacecraft heats up it gets cold and then hot and that makes all the electronic boards same the same way the electronics in your car go out they span and contract and eventually something breaks so that's that's the fundamental limit to the lifetime of the clock we have uh, tubes like those little ion trap tubes they're sealed and we have some that have lasted uh, well over five years uh, well, gosh, I guess it's nine years now because it was five when we started this project. Um, and so we don't see, you know, we can make a seal that lasts a, a long, long time. And the uh, mercury atoms and the, and the things inside of the tube don't actually go away. So um, it's really just the electronics. Okay, so my question, uh, the one way tracking that you can do with the, with the accurate uh, atomic talk, clock uh, you, you're only getting radial information. Uh, you, you know, you're only, you're only getting very accurate, but line it's... Line of sight information. Line, line of sight information. Right. Uh, would, is it at some point in the future, could you like have a second master station at maybe Mars or something, and then you could get ranging from two different directions? You could, and in fact... Wouldn't that be better? Uh, one of the concepts for humans going to Mars is to put a Mars aerostationary satellite, and that would provide tracking services while at Mars for the astronauts on the surface, as well as approaching vehicles. And so in that little cartoon, I showed actually two arrows going to that little rocket, and that was demonstrating that, that very possibility. Another thing, which we've actually done quite a bit of, um, JPL is famous for doing optical navigation. We take cameras, we take images of celestial bodies with a star background, and over time you can figure out your location relative to those bodies. You could couple that process, which is called plane of sky information because it's angular information with the line of sight information that uh, the ranging provides, and now you have a more complete kind of three-dimensional fix of your location in space. So that's another possibility that we could that, that we're envisioning. Thank you. Okay, we have some, uh, I guess these are social media questions. <laughs> I've been handed. Um, so the first one is, is for Todd. Okay. <laughs> what are the effects of general relativity on atomic clocks in outer space far from Earth's gravitational field? Okay, so the GPS system actually has to deal with this. They actually, uh, the frequency that it would naturally transmit in its orbit they actually artificially reduce that frequency because the clocks on Earth tick at a different rate than the clocks in the GPS constellation. And so this is, this is a fact of life. This is something we have to deal with. We have to deal with it today routinely, even with two-way data. And so using DSAC in the future with one-way data, we would have to correct for general relativistic effects. They're small, but they're substantial. And if we didn't correct for them, they would be the largest error source that we would encounter in going to places like Mars and Jupiter. So do clocks click, tick faster or slower on Mars than they do they here? They click faster at Mars because okay. it's a smaller gravity well than at Earth. 
It's an inside joke. We spent 10 minutes this afternoon trying to figure out the answer to that question in case someone asked it. Your head can get dizzy thinking about the signs, minus, plus. If you don't get it right, you get it wrong. Okay, I have another question from the uh, cybersphere. Since DSAC operates at the level of atoms, are there any challenges because of quantum mechanics? Um, well, actually, we use quantum mechanical effects. That's exactly how the, this, this wiggling I was talking about with this electron is actually a quantum mechanical effect. Um, but one of the uh, reasons we trap the ions in a field is to reduce any perturbations on the atoms but we don't get to the level of quantum mechanical effects uh, in, in that. So um, the challenges are to design a very magnetically clean clock. That whole clock, all that metal, none of it is magnetic. So it's all non-magnetic metals. And those magnetic fields, the stray magnetic fields, would induce a quantum mechanical effect. So that's a challenge because non-magnetic screws are hard to find. Actually, to follow up on that, we talk about the harsh environment of space, and people's perceptions might be the space around the vehicle, but really the space inside the vehicle is an environment we have to deal with. The changing temperatures inside the spacecraft, the magnetic fields from the outer environment, as well as the magnetic fields from the spacecraft itself could impact the stability of the clock, and so we have to deal with that. Okay, I have another question here. Could nearby spacecraft use a DSAC that is close by? So um, what DSAC does, and we didn't really get into this, is it takes a USO and it uses that tuning fork feature that Alan talked about. And we control the output of USO to get a more stable frequency on longer time scales. So in 10 seconds, we're really adopting the stability of the USO that is part of this process. And in fact, USOs are used routinely for communicating between nearby spacecraft. An example that we used at Earth and at the Moon, at Earth is the GRACE mission. They use uh, communication links between two spacecraft that are in orbit. There are a few hundred kilometers apart, and the time for that signal to go back and forth is very short. And so over those periods of time, it's a USO that's dominant. DSAC probably wouldn't be a huge help for that process. What really matters for DSAC is looking at the evolution of the frequency and time over long periods of time. So you're taking measurements at a, a period of time, and then you're not taking measurements for a day, and you start taking them again. You don't want your frequency and time source to have drifted significantly away from what it's supposed to be, because that becomes an error that you have to deal with in this trajectory determination process. And you remember, we have only a limited amount of data to figure out that trajectory. So errors like clocks make that harder. OK, this one's from a Ustream chat. So we got you covered, Ustream. Could an Earth orbiting DSAC augment the deep space network for navigating existing probes and missions? So the challenge there is, you know, the one answer would be yes. But actually, the real challenge for an orbiting spacecraft is knowing its location precisely. So for this DSN enterprise to work, we actually do um, uh, location of the of monuments that define the antenna face center to within a centimeter you know, of where that signal will enter that antenna. We know that in inertial space in an absolute way to within a centimeter. We'd be challenged for, say, a geostationary spacecraft with DSAC to have that kind of accuracy. So while the frequency and time stability on the satellite would be good, and could augment the DSN, we'd be challenged knowing where that spacecraft is at to participate in this navigation enterprise. So from the sound of things, there's kind of a log jam or a traffic jam at bottleneck at the uh, Deep Space Network. Uh, can you comment about any plans to expand the DSN to, because Unless the current missions are basically going to die out in the next few years, um, with the number of missions that will be coming online, we're going to be needing more DSN capability. Yeah, That's there's true. currently five missions at Mars right now, right? Is it just five? Five. Curiosity, more. Opportunity, Maven. Maven's on the way. Maven, no, Maven's there. Maven's there. 
ExoMars, ExoMars, MRO, MRO, Odyssey, Odyssey. TGO's on the way. So there's six at Mars, so yeah. There's a lot. Um, I can't really speculate as to what the NASA planners are doing about adding antennas. Um, there are, I'm sure there are plans for that, but DSAC is one way in which we can use the existing network a lot more efficiently. And so in that architectural trade, the planners need to decide, is it, is it uh, uh, more cost effective to put a DSAC on board a spacecraft and expand our, our user base that way or adding more antennas? And I'm sure the, the answer to that will depend on how well we are at reducing the size of DSAC, making it more affordable for next users, um, and putting that into the mix of, of the planning. So our current fleet is not taxing DSN to its limit then? Not right now. Okay. But when Down I start looking at the Armada of vehicles that the human program is contemplating, I don't know. Maybe that could change. Yeah. Thank the you. The DSN has a lot of, I mean, it's busy. Don't, don't. The, the antennas are, are, they're always on. And they're always talking to some spacecraft. And I'm sure if you talk to mission managers for these different missions, they would want more tracking time. Uh, than they get right now. So it's doable now, but you know, it's kind of getting to be capacity, so. In fact, I have an anecdotal story that um, with the arrival of MAVEN, Odyssey wasn't getting as much tracking time and that was stressing their ability to figure out their orbits to the level yeah. that they needed to. There was a question here. Where will the launch take place? So the question is, where will the launch take place? We will be launched from the historic Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. SpaceX has renting that, that former Saturn V shuttle pad and converting it for the Falcon Heavy. So, question. Cesium, rubidium, mercury. So the question um, is, why do we pick mercury? Unfortunately, I'm not an atomic clock physicist. And so I can only tell you that that's what the guy who knows what he's doing said to use. Um, seriously, there are, it has to do with the way the electrons in the nucleus of the atom interact and the frequencies, the specific frequencies, and can you get parts that generate those frequencies. And so it's kind of a, a quasi-practical decision for an ion trap clock like we have. Um, the common gas cell clocks like the GPS, uh, the GPS satellites have, they use a, a transition metal called rubidium um, in a gas form, um, and they picked it probably for a variety of both practical and physics reasons. It usually turns out to be something like that. Um, cesium is commonly used um, in Earth-based clocks, um, uh, and likewise, there are practical and historic reasons for that. But you can do it with a wide variety of atoms. It just depends on really whether or not you can how hard or easy it is to actually build it, to construct it. And one more note to add on performance. Um, we're anticipating that the DSEC that we fly um, is maybe five times more stable than the rubidiums. And the other feature of the mercury clock is it doesn't, it doesn't drift. So on top of uh, random instabilities, there's usually some, some pseudo-deterministic drift that pulls the clock away. Rubidiums intrinsically have that, DSAC will not. And so if you factor that effect with the instability, we're about 50 times um, more accurate than, than the flying GPS clocks today. Okay. I only see two people we put to sleep, so that's pretty good out of this, <laughs> out of this crowd. So any other questions? I think we're done. Thanks again.